2020 marked a major shift in American thinking toward communist China. With trust broken and ties cut off, Western patience with the regime is running out. Some consider it a battle between the Chinese Communist Party and the democratic world, with the U.S. at its head. An organization called the Clean Network has emerged around the world. It's reportedly completely free from equipment made in China. China has used stolen U.S. military technology for decades to boost its own armed forces. But new U.S. measures are working to put that to a stop. The battle has also expanded to what are called soft power sources, like culture, education and medicine. And Beijing has seemingly weaponized everything in its arsenal, but now it's facing backlash from all directions. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Today, we will give a summary of U.S.-China relations from this year. 2020 was definitely unusual. We witnessed a dramatic change in U.S.-China relations. A series of countermeasures against Beijing unfolded this year one after another. The U.S. clearly no longer trusts the CCP regime. Chinese companies came under scrutiny this year. Top of the list are Huawei and TikTok. The Pentagon warned that military personnel should delete TikTok from all and any of their smartphones. At the beginning of the year 2020, a number of U.S. military branches took the advice. They banned this Chinese-owned social media app on government-issued smartphones. In July, the House of Representatives voted and passed a bill regarding TikTok. It says federal employees are barred from downloading the video sharing app on government issued devices. A similar bill was passed by Homeland Security and the Governmental Affairs Committee just days after. In August, the Senate unanimously voted to approve the bill. When asked whether he recommends downloading TikTok, Pompeo said, quote, only if you want your private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. The Trump administration has tried to ban TikTok from smartphone app stores in the U.S. TikTok sued, arguing such actions would violate free speech and due process rights, and the legal proceedings are still in progress. As to Huawei, further sanctions are in place. This March, President Trump signed legislation to bar the use of U.S. subsidies by telecom carriers. The legislation forbids carriers from using government subsidies to purchase network equipment from Huawei or other companies with national security concerns. In June, the Trump administration determined that Huawei is backed by Chinese military, and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission officially designated Huawei as a national security threat. The FCC also barred telecommunications providers from using $8.3 billion in a government subsidy program to purchase equipment from Huawei. In a July 15th press conference, Secretary of State Pompeo announced imposing visa restrictions on certain Huawei employees for their human rights violations. Starting this September, the U.S. requires licenses for selling Huawei semiconductors made abroad with U.S. technology. The U.S. put Huawei on the entity list last May. With the ongoing sanctions, the effect of that was revealed this year. At the Huawei Developer Conference 2020, Huawei Consumer Business CEO admitted many of its models were already out of stock. And Huawei's flagship models may not be able to upgrade due to the lack of chips. And the tightened control on such enterprises is reflected on the U.S. entity list. In June, the U.S. Department of Commerce placed 24 enterprises on its entity list for their support of the CCP's military procurement. Another nine Chinese agencies were also on the list for violating human rights in Xinjiang. Thus, these enterprises will not be able to conduct transactions with the U.S. In July, the Department of Commerce and Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, put 11 more Chinese enterprises on the list. These companies are accused of cooperating with the Chinese regime and conducting human rights abuses, mass arbitrary detentions and forced labor. It was exposed two of them have collected DNA data from Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. These are two major Chinese gene technology companies, Xinjiang Silk Road BGI and Beijing Liuhe BGI. The Commerce Department announced last week it had added 77 new names to the entity list. 61 of the new additions were from China. Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation Incorporated, or SMIC, is China's biggest chipmaker. It was the first name to appear on the list. 
10 of SMIC's associated companies, including the company's local branches, were also on the list. The world's largest drone maker, DJI, from China was also added to the list. It is accused of conducting wide-range human rights violations through high-technology surveillance. The entity list now includes more than 300 Chinese entities. The consequences of expanding the blacklist is reflected in other areas, too. For example, China used to maintain a high success rate in rocket launches, but experienced three failures in just several months' time. Though it's not been officially proven, many Chinese believe that's the result of the U.S. chip blockade. The U.S.-China relationship is a turbulent one, but why does it change so drastically? This year, the pandemic has been one major trigger. Beijing's cover-up of the CCP, or Chinese Communist Party virus, completely has further destroyed its credibility. The Trump administration has made it clear that it doesn't trust Beijing and has taken a hardline stance against it. First, let's review the ongoing pandemic and look at how it all started. At the beginning of 2020, the CCP virus spread across Wuhan, China, the virus epicenter. Washington state reported the first confirmed case in the U.S. in January. By the end of January, President Trump ordered a travel ban, preventing foreign nationals who had visited China within 14 days from entering the U.S. As the situation worsened around the globe, the CCP's uncooperative behavior toward calls for international investigations and cover-up of the dangers of the virus made the pandemic control even more challenging. Starting in March, the White House began calling the virus the China virus, denouncing China's lack of transparency and its delay in sharing information about the virus. In retaliation, China's foreign ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian suggests that the virus might have been brought to China by the U.S. Army. The U.S. staunchly denied the claim, accusing Beijing of spreading false information. During the process, the World Health Organization was praising the Chinese regime for its pandemic control measures and cooperative attitude, a stark contradiction of much of Beijing's actions. The White House criticized the WHO for its China-centric attitude, despite the majority of its funding coming from the U.S. In April, President Trump announced that the U.S. would suspend funding to the WHO and would review the organization's performance during the pandemic. The state of Missouri also filed a lawsuit against China in April over the outbreak. President Trump again expressed his disappointment toward Beijing, saying he could possibly cut all ties with the regime. Later in July, the Trump administration submitted formal notice of withdrawal from the WHO. Aside from the virus, another factor has proven particularly rocky for U.S.-China relations, the trade war. As U.S. trust in Beijing collapsed, the trade deal between them also soured. President Trump said in July, a phase two trade deal with China isn't under consideration. When describing why, Trump explained the relationship with China has been severely damaged. As a result, more and more supply chains are now moving out of China and unemployment is rising. Radio Free Asia spoke to a businessman who witnessed the change, saying that deterioration of U.S.-China ties may cause social stability issues. But the often exaggerated so-called official statistics put out by the regime officials often don't show the big picture. On January 15th, the U.S. and China signed the long-awaited Phase 1 trade deal at the White House. That's eight months after CCP head Xi Jinping breached the U.S.-China trade deal he was about to sign. China agreed to purchase at least an additional $200 billion worth of American goods and services over the next two years. The agreement also leaves tariffs on $250 billion U.S. billion worth of Chinese products in place. In February, China's finance ministry announced it would cut in half tariffs on over 1,700 U.S. goods. Crude oil, meat products and soya beans are among those that stand to benefit from the tariff cuts. During a phone call with President Trump, Xi Jinping reaffirmed that the pandemic would not affect the agreement. According to a U.S. Trade Representative announcement, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Chinese Vice Premier Liu He spoke on the phone to pledge their continued support for the Phase 1 trade deal. While on June 18th, President Trump tweeted that the U.S. certainly does maintain a policy option under various conditions of a complete decoupling from China. 
U.S. Customs and Border Protection issued a notice this August requiring that goods produced in Hong Kong and exported to the U.S. must label their origin as China. The requirement took effect September 25th. Goods that fail to comply face a punitive 10 percent tax based on the assessed value of the goods at U.S. ports. Tensions between the U.S. and China also extend to diplomacy. Alongside a regime widely considered untrustworthy, the reputations of its consulates have also tarnished. For many, they're no longer a symbol of good relations, but rather a convenient stage for espionage activities. The Chinese consulate general in Houston was deemed to be one of them. In July, the U.S. ordered China to close its Houston, Texas consulate in 72 hours. Beijing called the move political provocation. But U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the decision was made because of China's continued intellectual property theft. When asked, President Trump said it was, quote, always possible. He would order the closure of more Chinese consulates. The same night the order was issued, video emerged of consulate staff burning documents in the building's courtyard. The fire triggered an alarm and firefighters quickly arrived on the scene. But they were blocked from entering the compound. Later in July, Beijing notified the U.S. it must close the American consulate general in the city of Chengdu. Chinese authorities called it a legitimate and necessary response to the U.S. closure of the Houston consulate. A solemn flag-lowering ceremony marked the end of the U.S. consulate's 35 years of operation in Chengdu. The U.S. consulate's official account tweeted a farewell message, expressing best wishes to China and the Chinese people. Many netizens reported being touched by the words and actions of the U.S. diplomats. One of them tweeted, the U.S. has been helping China selflessly from culture to health care, education, the economy and technology for a long time. As an ordinary Chinese person, I will always remember and be grateful. In contrast, a photo of the Chinese consulate in Houston burning documents made headlines. The consulate was reportedly penalized for the pollution caused by the incident. The Trump administration has made a point of clearly distinguishing between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. Chinese officials and political entities serve the interests of the communist regime, not the people, making it an important step to identify the difference between them. U.S. actions, like imposing visa restrictions on regime officials, appear to be having a positive effect on both the United States and the people of China. The Trump administration has tightened visa rules restricting how long Chinese Communist Party members are allowed to stay in the country. The new visa policy was issued earlier in December. It reduces the maximum validity of B-1, B-2 visitor visas for party members and their families. The duration has been shortened from 10 years to just one month. The statement says the measure is aimed at protecting the nation from the regime's malign influence, adding that the CCP works to influence Americans through propaganda, economic coercion, and other nefarious activities. It also explained the CCP sends agents to the United States to monitor, threaten, and report on Chinese nationals and Chinese-American groups. According to a New York Times July report, the Trump administration is considering a sweeping ban on entry into the U.S., The ban would target CCP members and their families and may extend to members of the People's Liberation Army and executives from state-owned companies. The ban could block as many as 270 million Chinese citizens from entering the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced on December 21st the State Department issued additional visa restrictions for CCP officials, specifically those suspected of human rights violations. The restrictions also apply to their family members. The limit's formal launch also ramped up support for another trend. Since then, a new wave of Chinese people choosing to renounce their allegiance to the Communist Party has soared. The movement to quit the CCP began 16 years ago. More than 37 million Chinese people have since walked away from the party and its affiliated organizations. The visa restrictions aren't just limited to Chinese Communist Party members. They also affect specific groups of people and professions. The CCP is notorious for its propaganda and its use of overseas Chinese students to do its dirty work. But in good news for Americans, these groups are now being targeted. The State Department issued a determination in February under the Foreign Missions Act. It requires Chinese state-run media organizations to register their staff and property with the U.S. government, just like diplomatic entities. 
The five organizations labeled as foreign missions are Xinhua News Agency, China Global Television Network, previously known as CCTV, China Radio International, the parent company of the China Daily Newspaper, and the parent company of People's Daily Newspaper. In March, the State Department set a limit on the number of staff members allowed to work in the U.S. for those five major state-run outlets. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said in the statement that the agencies are required to reduce their total staff members from 160 to 100. The move forced the companies to cut nearly half their U.S.-based staff. In June, the foreign missions list got even longer. The State Department also designated the U.S. operations of China Central Television, China News Service, the People's Daily and the Global Times as foreign missions. On the same day, President Trump signed an executive order to suspend or limit U.S. entry for H-1B visa holders. The H-1B visa allows U.S. companies to employ graduate-level workers in specialty occupations. The suspension expired December 31, 2020. President Trump issued a statement at the end of May, banning Chinese nationals with ties to the country's military from entering the U.S. on student or scholar visas. The ban covers Chinese graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. Previously, they came to the U.S. on the F-1 student visa and the J-1 exchange visa. According to Reuters, the U.S. revoked visas of more than 1,000 Chinese nationals as of September. The move was to suspend the entry of students and researchers who are considered security risks. Now we turn to the South China Sea. China stakes a disproportionately large claim of the waters in the region, having drawn what's known as the Nine Dash Line. Beijing has been using its claims to bully neighboring nations, such as invading their exclusive economic zones and exploiting their resources. For example, Chinese ships have over-excavated seabeds off the coast of Taiwan. It's caused the land near the shores to sink. The reason why Beijing is doing this is because its nine-dash line encompasses almost the entire South China Sea. So the regime treats the ocean region as if it completely belongs to China. Secretary Pompeo called the Communist Party's claim to the area completely illegal on July 13th, emphasizing that, quote, the United States policy is crystal clear. The South China Sea is not China's maritime empire. China claims about 90 percent of the potentially energy-rich South China Sea. But nearby countries like Brunei, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan and Vietnam also claim parts of it. About $3 trillion worth of trade passes through the area each year. Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping had promised the U.S. that China wouldn't militarize the South China Sea. But that promise hadn't been kept. In recent years, Beijing has turned the sea's small islands into military bases. Tensions continue to rise as China conducts more and more frequent military exercises there. To combat those actions, the U.S. ramped up naval drills in the South China Sea. Washington sent two major aircraft carrier fleets to conduct naval exercises there on July 4th and the 17th. Two days later, the U.S., Japan and Australia came together to hold joint military exercises covering the South China Sea and Philippine waters. Right after the mission, one of the American aircraft carriers, the USS Nimitz, began joint exercises with the Indian Navy in the Indian Ocean. That's as the U.S. and its allies work to arm India with new, highly sophisticated weapons from Israel, France and Russia. President Trump has also announced a plan to expand the annual G7 summit, intending to turn it into an 11-nation summit to include Russia, South Korea, Australia and India, a move aimed at strengthening the nations against the CCP. Back in September 2020, China flooded the Taiwan Strait at the northern end of the South China Sea with warplanes flyovers for two days. The aircrafts crossed into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. The time frame of the event coincided with a high-ranking U.S. envoy's visit to Taiwan. U.S. support and arms sales to Taiwan have boosted the island's resolve, but Hong Kong hasn't been so lucky. Beijing's national security law over Hong Kong opened the door for mainland Chinese suppression. Hong Kong, if translated word for word, means fragrant harbor. But now some say the Chinese regime's law turned Hong Kong into a smelly harbor. Many of the privileges Hong Kong enjoyed for years are gone, as the island has been stripped of its democracy and rule of law.
The national security law officially took effect at the end of June. One day before it activated, the U.S. State Department announced all exports of U.S.-made military equipment to Hong Kong were to be halted immediately. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also delivered a report to Congress, concluding Hong Kong no longer enjoys a high degree of autonomy. While in May, President Trump said he instructed officials to, quote, begin the process of eliminating policy that gives Hong Kong different and special treatment. Trump said the freedom and human rights of Hong Kong's people have been taken away, adding that it's become difficult for major financial hub to compete with other free markets. He estimated that many Hong Kongers will move elsewhere as a result.